Okay. So we finished the last class by basically writing the hardest part of the code, essentially this function, assemble matrices, okay, that assembles the T, B, and Q matrix. And what I didn't show you guys earlier was at the beginning uh, where all this setup occurs, right? So the whole first part of the code that I sort of ha already had written when we came here was essentially just to read in and process this data somehow, right? <coughs> the first 20 lines of code or whatever. But there is the very last line actually calls that function, right? So the last thing we do when we set up the code, sort of in the setup, is we, we read all this stuff in, but at that point, once we have all the data in, we actually have enough information already to compute the TB and Q matrices fully. Uh, no matter, it, that doesn't depend on, you know, they're the same, they don't change for over the time steps, right? So we can compute them right at the beginning and then just hold on to them, and that's, so that's what we do. So that function we actually wrote last time, the symbol matrices, uh, it's the last thing I do in the initialization phase, right? So I call it. So what that means is that s these variables, self t, self b, self q, they're available to my other functions to use, right? And so at this point, we're then ready to write a function that will compute a single time step, right? <coughs> so we want it to be general so that it'll work for mixed method, implicit, explicit, right? So we're gonna put some logic in there for that. Essentially, uh, if method equals mixed, then we want to do A equals B equals and then P of P n plus one is equal to sparse solve A comma B, right? So this function takes a single argument, Pn, that's the old pressure, right? So the function takes the old pressure and computes the new pressure. And for the mixed method, it does that by interpolating the explicit and implicit methods. Remember we had this theta, and theta, if it equals one half, is the crank nicholson method, right? So I'm just setting up this linear system of equations, A, Pn plus one, Pn plus one equals to B. So I set up A and B, and then we solve it, and we use the sparse solver. So in MATLAB, if you if your data structures A and B are sparse, like if matrix A is sparse, then you use the backsplash operator, then it's going to use an iterative solver, and it'll be you know, it'll solve it more smart in a smarter fashion than trying to do a direct solve. So uh, that's for the mixed method. Else if method equals explicit P is equal to P in, I'm sorry, P in plus one is equal to P in plus one over B times DT times Q minus T dot P. All right, so in the explicit method, I don't have to invert a matrix, so I don't need to set up that system of equations. There's just a single line there. Also, understand, you know, T is a matrix. If I dot P the vector P in into it, that's, that's a matrix vector multiplication, so I get a vector. So T dot PN gives me a vector, vector, that's a matrix, but it's just one over the diagonal, essentially. It B is a sparse data structure, so this, this actually curves. I was looking at that if that would work right, but it will. 
Okay? So there's the explicit method. And then my last thing is I'm just going to have an else statement. I could say else, in, else implicit, but I'm going to make the default implicit, right? So I don't. So in, in my input deck, I say implicit, but I'm just, you know, even if you didn't put any method at all, then you would get, if method is empty, um, then in that case, you're going to get an, an implicit solve. So if you didn't specify a method in your input deck, you'd get an implicit solve as the default. Right? So that is A equals T plus B dt. B is equal to B dt. So then I want my function to return p n plus 1. So that you know, it does what I want, right? It takes in an old pressure and it returns the new via one of these methods for a single time step. And again, the reason I want to write small functions is good, you know, you could easily have put this logic inside your, you know, loop. Oh, inside a time stepping loop, right? It wouldn't have been that big a deal. You could easily do that. But the reason I want to write these small functions is for debugging purposes mainly, right? If my code doesn't run, if it, if it doesn't run at all, and it fouls up in this function or in any small function, it'll, the, 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 the stack trace on the debugger will tell me where it failed, and I know exactly what function to go look at, right? Whereas if you have all your code in the, the whole thing, it's not going to be as... And it's not going to tell you what function it failed. It's going to say it failed in there somewhere. Right? And if you're lucky, uh, it might tell you the line number, maybe, right, if, you're, if it's really good. But, but for sure, uh, the, the stack trace is going to tell you what function it failed in. And so that's one reason to wi write small functions. And, and the other case is, and even, even if your code runs, but say produces the wrong answer, right, if you can test the functions individually, and they're small functions, this is small enough and for a small problem, I can test this. I can run one time step by hand, right? But I can't run 200. But I can run one time step by hand. And if this function does what it's supposed to do for you know, one time step, it's going to do what it's supposed to do for all of them. Right? So that is my uh, compute you know, time step function. So then uh, run is basically going to run the code or run, you know, solve the problem. So basically, I'm going to start with p equals the initial pressure, and I'm going to use this ones function. So so I'm going to say that the initial pressure is ones, right? So that's just a vector. That's the number of it, grids long, or one, 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 right? And then I multiply that by the initial pressure. That's going to give me PD, 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 or PI, PI, PI. Okay? And so then, really, uh, if I just want to solve this thing, all I have to do then is just write a really small loop. 4N range, number of time steps, and I'm going to go plus 1 because number of time, the range function is going to return something that goes from 0 to whatever. 0 to the number of time steps minus one, but I want it to go from one to the number of time steps. So that's what the plus one is there for. Um, so yeah, then, then all I have to do is essentially write P is equal to self compute time step, P. And that's it. So for one of the number of time steps, compute a single time step taking in, right? So initially, P is going to be the reservoir pressure the, or the initial pressure. So that's going to go into this function. And then what comes out is going to be the time, the, a time step later's pressure, right? Then the thing's going to iterate. It's going to loop so that that pressure will become that one, and I'll compute a new pressure. Right? Then that pressure will become that one, and I'll compute a new pressure to the end. 
And so then if all I was interested in was the very final pressure, the pressure of the last time step, then I could just take the return this pressure from this function. Okay. Yeah, so that's 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 the next uh, that's the next chore. And that's in fact why, if you notice, I have run and I have a plot frequency command. Right? So what I'm basically going to put in is some logic that allows me to dump a plot at some frequency. It could be every every time step. It could be every ten, every hundred, whatever, whatever I want. What do you mean? Well, I'm just going to write an if statement. You can write that in that way. Yeah, this is just an argument to the function plot frequency. I have I set that to none. Is just a default argument. Right? So if I if I don't I can run this run without any arguments, and it'll just say plot frequency none, and in that case, it's just going to give me the last time step back. Right. So then the logic I'll do, I'll, I'll use to implement that. Uh, first thing, I'm going to just create a couple of empty vectors where I'm going to store things. Uh, P plot um, time. So then in here is where I'll put the logic. So I'm going to say if plot frequency is not none and I modulo plot frequency equal to zero, then P plot. So the logic here is, and this is another reason I like plot Python. That just sort of reads like English, right? If plot frequency is not none, right, which it is by default, so this would be false by default, and it would immediately break out of here. Okay. So this will also Python implements a short circuiting when you have multiple so I have an and statement. So it's going to test this: is this true or false? And then if, if and only if this is true, test this. So in other words, if this is false, it's immediately going to break out of the loop, uh, the if statement, okay, and not do anything. So it's going to say if the, okay. So if this is true, so if I change my argument to give plot frequency some value other than none, then test is my iteration divided by the plot frequency zero. In other words, is it evenly divisible? Right? Because you know if. Let's say I run my final time is, well, I mean, if, if my final time is seven, right, seven times, my final time step is seven, and then I set prop frequency to five, then I'm only going to get a dump at the fifth time step, right? I won't get one at the last one. So we have to put some more logic in. I think it's, I think it's appropriate that you always at least have the last one, right, the, the final time. So uh, also, just for plotting purposes, it also helps to append the time, which is the iteration number times the time step. Yes. Right. And then, so I gotta say, But that's saying, I have this additional if statement that's saying that, so if this is true, so this could be true on the last time step, right? If my last time step is 10 and my plot frequency is 5, I'm going to append the plot here, right? But it's the last time step, so I want to break out of the loop. I want to be done with the loop, so I put a break statement there. And the reason I want that there is because I also have this else if i is equal to the number of time steps
Okay, so what this logic is just saying is if it's if it's the plot frequency at which I requested the plot, or if it's the last time step, save it. Okay. So that's what the, that's what that logic is. Then, then I can compute the new time step, and then just the last thing after the for loop is over, then I'll. After the for loop is over, what I want to do is make this variable something I can access from outside the function. Okay. So this just me this is just so I can I can get it from outside the function. So the reason those break statements are there is because if it's the last time step. I don't want it to update right here. So I want to break out of the for loop before this computation is done. Okay. So then I just have some sort of convenience functions I've defined. This one called get solution, uh, which just gets the last thing from pplot, which is either the last, it's the last time step, right? So if I run it for 200 or 150, that little function will get the last one for me, because I'm storing a whole bunch of them in there. Um, and then there's some other things that, that, that basically create plots for me. So the first one just plots the reservoir uh, pressure as a function of reservoir position, and the second one plots the bottom hole pressure for a constant rate injector well. And in this problem, we had two, right? One at five and one, one at five and one constant rate well. One at five, one at fourteen nine. So I'm going to plot the bottom hole pressure of those guys. V, and that's why we computed the. We couldn't do that with it properly if we didn't compute the productivity index. Okay. So in theory, uh, this code should work. Um, So, so I, for the for this part, I'll go over to the to the iPod the notebook here. No. Yeah, actually, uh, I call it. You, you heard me. I just called it an iPod on notebook. That used to be the name of the project because it was associated with this little sort of super Python shell script called IPython. Uh, but then later, uh, later they, they came along and, and they made it sort of what they're gonna, what, what you might, you know, in computer science language you say kernel ag agnostic. So in other words, it's not necessarily just associated with Python. So you guys have seen me do the MATLAB, right? From the Jupyter Notebook. And so that's where the name comes from actually. The Jupyter name is actually short, uh, it's a conglomeration of JU stands for Julia. So Julia is a MATLAB type language that comes from MIT, also free. Pi, of course, is Python. And R, the R on the end is the R statistical language, right? So uh, this, this interface has became popular with people using Julia and Python and R. And many other that, that you can, like you've seen me do it with MATLAB. There's lots of languages you can actually hook up in, uh, to Jupyter and, and do this kind of interactive stuff. And oh, well, they had to make it sound like something cool, right? The, the TE, I guess, doesn't really stand for anything, but it just makes the name kind of flow, right? Jupiter. Uh, I think it's a catchy name. Uh, th th this project got a like major research grant from the or development grant from the Sloan Foundation, and Microsoft, Bloomberg, like a lot of data analytics companies. Because what you can do with these what you can do with these uh, uh, notebooks is you can really easily just uh, post them to the web. You can make there's little interactive widgets for them, so you can like explore your data interactively. And so maybe I'll show you some of that sometime. But let, let me just I'll show you how like you could say put it up a web page or something. But let me just uh, quickly uh, kind of finish this, and, and I'll sh maybe show you something more about that. So like when I so 
this is sort of that object-oriented programming that I was talking about. So this, this homework four takes in the input file, and that, that when I execute that, it stores everything in this problem object. Okay, and so I could have like problem one that, that has homework four, and I could have problem two where I have another input depth, right? And then I could say plot them in the same, you know, without having to rerun the whole code or anything like that. You know, I could generate one plot for homework, uh, you know, 4A and another one for homework 4B where they have different input depths, right? I make modifications to it. So everything, you know, this is sort of initialized and everything is stored in that problem thing. And then I can, you know, get, I can run functions on it or explore that data, right? So I had this problem and, you know, what it had like, uh, well, we, we, we created the T matrix, for example. Oh, so I'm going to let me view that right away. Um, let's see something. Uh, how about the bottom hole pressure well grids? Okay, is that another one that's not really? <laughs> um, uh, how about something simple like the, the compressibility? That's just an input, right? That just, that just comes from the input depth. Got too many things open. Yeah, so the compressibility just com is just read in, right? So all that's stored in this problem object. But then now I can also, you know, run run the code that we wrote. And you know, in theory, this is going to work. We'll see. Um, we'll see if it, you know. I haven't debugged this. I just wrote it live, and uh, it may or may not have bugs in it. Just for making a typo. Okay, it looks like it ran. So then I can say, I have that little convenience function, get solution. Okay, so there's the solution. And then I had another one that was called plot, right? right so there is a plot. Every, so we ran it 200 time steps. This is reservoir position versus, I mean, this is pressure versus reservoir position. And each of those lines represents one of those 200 time steps. So I can, you know, it's kind of a busy plot, but that's why, you know, I can go back up here and, and reduce the, the frequency, run it again, and there's less of it. Right? Or I think if I, if I only, if I don't give it an argument at all, then it's just going to take the last one. First one. No, no, that's the last. One. That's the last. One. Yeah, that's the last. One. Yeah. Also, uh, so also I think yeah. The, the first one is the, of course, the initial pressure, the reservoir pressure. Um, then I also had a function. HP, which allows me to plot the bottom hole pressure versus time for the two wells. Right. And so uh, what I'm running here, oops, what I'm running here is the case where the case where I have a, a constant permeability of 50 millidarcy and constant porosity of 0.2, uh, but I have these other cases I could run like. Uh, the permeability and porosity from the data file, right? That, this was a fully heterogeneous case. So all I have to do is change those in my inputs, go back over here, uh, oh, did I need to do that? Oops. This is an older version. There, there should be a command that says run all, but anyway. Yeah, so there, there then, this is for the heterogeneous case, right? So that's for the heterogeneous case. Now you have all these sort of bumps in the solution because of the heterogeneity. And then of course we could we could also run our, our validation problem. Oh, too, too far now. Our validation problem was the, the four grid blocks. 
So you saw I, I was running that with four, with 20,000 grids, the, the previous one. I don't know. I think in the problem, I didn't ask you how to run that many. Oh, did I not comment them out? Yep. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess it, it, it takes the last values. So that's for the, for the four blocks. Um, what else? What else is interesting? No, I mean, I guess just a just a minute note about the the sort of Jupyter notebook since you guys asked. I mean, it's it's pretty cool because I can. And one of the reasons I like to use it, uh, well, I uh, I can open a cell here and I can I can convert the cell into a, like a really uh, quick markup language, so it's called Markdown. So, uh, When I execute this cell, so I go, you know, I just formatted a little list, you know, bullet points or whatever, uh, and and that's formatted as text. Uh, I can also do things like write equations, uh, like using the, the syntax that you'd use in uh, LaTeX, right? So, um, you know, I don't know what, what this will say. making stuff up right so I get an equation nice look nice formatted equation right so it's, it's kind of a nice way to sort of mix text and code, right? So you can you can sort of explain what you're doing in text and even use equations and then uh, you know and then put your code in there too and run it. And then the cool thing is um, so I'm running this like as a program on my computer, but what I can do is I can go in here and say uh, download as and I can download it as HTML. And so you see this right here. This is a static HTML file, so these, this is not executable code here, right? But it, it's just a web page. It's an HTML document, that, so then I could stick that on my web page if I wanted to share this with you. Or um, you could also even do, if I go back to here, um, well the live one, this one, I could even go download as uh, PDF and see if this works. Give it a second. What did it do? Yeah. So it actually created a little report for me. Right. So there's all the code. My equation is nice, neat, neatly typeset. My figures are in there. So it created a little PDF report uh, right from the right from the code. So I think it's a neat way to sort of communicate ideas and information and. You know, one of the one of the things I use it for a lot is uh, there's a real easy way you can just post the raw Jup the raw Jupyter notebook on the web, and there's the various services that are render it for you as HTML. And the nice thing about that is that, like, say you and I are collaborating on something, I want to share some ideas or some code with you, I can send you the link, 
and it'll and then you know I can send you the link such that it's rendered and you can view it like you're, you're looking at it here is static right uh, you can view it but you know say then two days later I, I find a bug or I make some changes or I add some features and I want to share those updates with you you can all I have to do is push my raw notebook back to the web and that renderer will automatically update everything and so in other words I mean, I'm sure how many times you've worked with a classmate or something and you're like, here's version one, here's version two, oh, I made a mistake, here's version three, and you're like sending PDFs back and forth nonstop, right? Uh, oh, you know, well, well, this way I could all just share that link with you and then you can just go to that web link and, you know, and as I make incremental improvements o over time, the link won't change, you know, you can just continue to go back there and see updates and stuff like that, so, anyway, so little bit about the Jupyter Notebook. So that, you know, the, that's homework four. I'll post these, uh, I'll post this for you guys if, for, to use as reference. I think, you know, that, that along with the videos, you know I, know, I know you probably don't know Python, but it's a fairly easy language to sort of understand the concepts. And th that along with the videos, I think if you go back and listen, uh, I mean, did you guys find utility in this? Like, sort of live coding, so you don't, I mean, I could just show you the code, but if you if you hear me go line by line and what I'm thinking and the logic behind it, I think is that useful for you guys? So, I mean, I hope I didn't waste three class periods on it. So I'll post it for you. And, I mean, essentially, wh what I've done here has all the essential features you need to work your project. The, the main thing that's, that's different uh, is the assemble matrix feature, right? Because you have to assemble those inner block transmissibilities in 2D instead of instead of just 1D. Uh, that aside from that, and the little bit of logic that we implemented to find the wells, right? So remember, because our grid block delta x could vary, the wells might fall in a different grid block because the wells are in fixed x location positions. So we we wrote a little if statement to find the X position locations of the wells. In 2D, you, you have to check in the Y position too, right? But other than that, I mean, really, it's just those two things you have to change. You have to implement a feature so that you can search in the X and Y direction, and you have to implement the, the um, assemble matrix routine for 2D, which, by the way, is very similar to what you did in homework one. You just have to make provisions for interblock transmissibilities and such. And, and this, the, other than that, all the essential features to, to write your project code are here. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is we're going to go over a 2D example, sort of line by line, 